Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. One minute. Okay. Wir brauchen die Strand Europa. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Yeah, present everywhere from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hello, I'm Olga Olaker. I'm Hugh Pope. Welcome. Here on War and Peace, we talk about Europe, Russia, the neighborhood that the two of them share, Turkey, and the issues that affect all of these countries. We're going to be paying particular attention to conflict, both in the region and nearby, and the conflicts that these countries get involved in far away. We want to understand how states' policies and actions help or hinder prospects for peace and resolution. But because conflict can't be understood without a broader context, we're also going to be bringing you some thoughts on that context, from politics to society to culture. A quick note before we begin this episode. When we recorded it a few short weeks ago, our guest, Anna Kovalenko, was one of the newly elected members of Ukraine's parliament, the Rada. Just days later, however, Anna had a new job. Vladimir Zelensky, the new president of Ukraine, had named her a deputy head of his administration with the portfolio that covers the security sector, among other things. I think that makes our conversation with her that much more interesting. Listen in. With us on War and Peace today, we have Anna Kovalenko. Anna is uh, one of the newest members of Ukraine's parliament, the Rada. And she has a very interesting story about how she got to the Rada. She had just completed graduate work in theater studies when Ukrainians gathered on the Maidan to protest their government's uh, decision to renege on an agreement to sign up with the EU for EU association. And in those protests, Anna became uh, one of the leaders. She led the unit on the Maidan, the Women's Hundred, that um, comprised only women. There were co-ed units, there were only male units. Anna led the one that was just women. And after after the Maidan revolution overthrew that government, she became uh, an expert on security sector reform, in part because of the engagement she'd had during the revolution with various Ukrainian authorities as they negotiated uh, ways forward. And now Anna is a member of the parliament, the Rada. We'll see what other exciting things uh, are uh, coming up. I, I expect that there's far more that we can expect from her. But Anna, I, you were on the Maidan. You were trying to change from the old system to a new system. That was five years ago. How did you see the election of Vladimir Zelensky, whose party you're a member of, as a continuation of that revolution? And how do you see the last five years? Uh, hello, Olga. Thank you for this nice introduction and interesting and deep, actually, question, because uh, it was hard. We ha have still a war and uh, a lot of things we need to do in many kind of directions inside the country, in um, international area too. And I think for a new government, for a new parliament, for a new president, a lot of uh, real uh, serious uh, challenges. And um, yeah, and I think that he uh, looks like he has a plan what to do, because uh, in the end of uh, August, we already created a new government and uh, show to people that we have a real plan to make quick changes. And it's one of the youngest governments Ukraine has ever had. Yes, our prime minister, I think he's around 35. And, but he's very smart and uh, he has a very interesting uh, background. Actually, I knew him from Maidan too. Are there a lot of people who were active on the Maidan in Zelensky's party now? Uh, yes and no. A lot of different people in Zelensky uh, party actually uh, with a different kind of view on uh, history of Ukraine, culture of Ukraine. We are different, but we work like one. And the uh, first day in the parliament showed that. I know, it seemed to an outsider an amazing moment for Ukraine because we, the Ukraine we knew was either hewing to its ex-Soviet past or it was this very pro-European identity that we were witnessing. And suddenly we have someone who has been presented to us as an ex-actor, a comedian, someone we know very little about what what is he like as a person and does he represent something new in ukraine 
he has very serious intentions to change the country. He's a patriotic, uh, witty person with a good sense of humor, obviously. <laughs> but you know, it's a pro-Ukrainian party and pro-Ukrainian government. And I hope it will be on that position. We, of course, understand uh, and want to be uh, like close to European family, European country. And uh, like U.S. still our strategic partner. We have a board with the Russian Federation, like 2,500 uh, kilometers. It's like from here to, to France. And we will need to find like in a close future some kind of dialogue with them. It's an uh, interesting time, intensive time, and uh, it's a lot of responsibility. And I know that the president and his team very good understand this. Anna, can you give us a, a, maybe an anecdote of what it's like to meet with him? Because he seemed to avoid direct interviews with the press during the campaign. And you, you say this ex-comedian is a serious person, obviously facing very serious problems. Tell us what he's really like to work with. From beginning of campaign, he was very romantic. Romantic, not because of point of view, romantic because he was against the old system. And uh, now, like, uh, he has a good support uh, in a parliament, in new government, and more opportunities to realize his uh, expectations. And for you personally, what has it been like to interact with him? Okay, I'm have had few dialogue uh, with him about like defense and security and we discussed like some process uh, like lessons learned when uh, our like military guy can make uh, can take some experience from special operation forces or from from um, training and uh, he he's very deep person and uh, try to go deep in details to understand the mechanism how it's work how this process influence for to a big picture and a big strategy for develop our defense and security forces for example it's a show it's a small example to show that uh, he's uh, real involved and in a deep process what's going on. I have to ask you, it's been five years of trying to implement security sector reform in Ukraine, and you've been you've been on the front lines of that, uh, working very hard to change a system that really didn't want to change. We've seen this president appoint a civilian defense minister, finally, for the first time, starting off as a civilian, an actual civilian, not a military person who took off his uniform. What do you think are the next steps? What are the priorities to get security sector reform finally moving in Ukraine? With the priorities, it's very easy. He want to build like uh, strong and modern defense and security forces. And he wants real that in the same time, they will be under control and real serve to Ukrainians. And it's like our task in effect. And of course, we will stay on this uh, idea about integrations with the NATO and uh, compatibility with the NATO forces. Uh, and uh, in the same time, okay, for priority, it's uh, develop defense forces, a lot of changes and uh, support, for example, create uh, the plan of defense country. It's more broad things like then uh, just cooperate with the Minister of Defense. It's more about uh, uh, the military like defense plan for a whole country. And uh, he's real serious to to be closer uh, with the NATO and accept all kind of stanak what we need to uh, for that. Then of course education for uh, our future military leaders and uh, of course uh, support the transform the system of c2 uh, reform of uh, system of procurement and uh, the joint system of logistic he has probably very ambitious plan and, and other things it's a system of military um, reserve and uh, to make nice better infrastructure for the women in army and uh, it's like we probably will stay on the same uh, process of uh, GDP, 5%, we will uh, plan to spend on the, uh, to the army. And another thing, it's uh, another huge, huge challenges uh, 
for him it's our uh, defense industry we prepared a plan of like package of reform about defense industry but of course it will be like decision of new prime minister and uh, president himself and then parliament will support uh, the idea because it's like few ideas few models how to do this third priority it's reform uh, security sector and you know that the law of national security we need uh, uh, create a new law and security service and uh, intelligences and a new law about state secrecy but actually he needs to see for the all architecture of our security forces a lot of this was on the poroshenko agenda it just didn't happen right so what is zelensky going to do that's going to make him more successful at implementing these reforms when for five years, more than five years, the Porsche administration could not. Our first work day was around 16 hours. <laughs> and, you know, I think that, yeah, if he, if he will uh, start uh, doing the things what his uh, pro- previous, like, uh, presidents just talk, it will be successful. It's a story. Uh, and uh, you see the like example with the removal of uh, parliamentary immunity, like we partially, of course, uh, we just we have this discussion in the country like uh, last 25 years. You're so deeply involved with the armed forces and we've been following very closely the progress of the conflict with the Russian backed separatists with 13,000 people killed in the last uh, five years. Can can you tell us uh, what you have experienced of this war and how you think that uh, you can, from your new position, come to some resolution of it? I think it's, yeah, it's a new challenge because people expect from new team that they uh, stop the war. And... um, Well, it was a promise, right? Peace was a campaign promise. Right. But this is not, like, we have no easy decision for that. It's a very complex story. First of all, we want a peace on Ukraine terms and not uh, peace uh, for any prices, right? His campaign and his first step showed that he understands that the one of the important things, this is uh, economy, because if you want to be to develop your defense and security forces or you want to develop a successful country, uh, you need money for that, right? His program was very based on real economy changes and this is very right influence on the like uh, security situation in the country at all he has started already to project uh, with the reintegration on Donbass territory which Ukrainian part It's mean develop the infrastructure on Ukraine's side. I imagine it also shows these people that Kiev cares about them, right? Because that's been one of the one of the main issues is that if resources aren't going to the east. Yes, this is exactly about that. And they start a project to change uh, this uh, they try to improve condition to the to show the people that Ukraine uh, care about them and uh, like welcome. It's your country. Uh, and I think uh, actually the previous government should did it like many years ago, but they did not. And uh, I think, yeah, they just promised. And I think that uh, for a new president, it's a nice, nice step for beginning. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. We are talking to Anna Kovalenko, a member of Vladimir Zelensky's uh, Servant of the People Party in ruling party in Ukraine. Anna, can can you tell us a little about your experiences of traveling in eastern Ukraine? That sounds very unusual for someone in your position. Okay, I worked there in 2015 in a group. We tried to renew the connection on the Lugansk region because like Russians took our infrastructure for, for all kind of connection, for TV connection, radio, IP, and all this stuff. And we try renew. And yeah, I had opportunity to talk to people who is like living there. Yeah, they won't live in a peace country, but they were very uh, good to understand uh, that this war was begun by Russians. Like I, I had opportunity to work with our like defense and security forces, and uh, they patriotic and ready to like 
fight for our independence and I hope that they have this uh, spirits for still now. So Anna, you've also done a lot of work on the intelligence sector and working to reform that Ukraine's intelligence sector was very much inherited from the Soviet Union and continued to have a lot in common with the old Soviet KGB. Uh, well, is that a priority for Vladimir Zelensky? And what do you think needs to be done? What do you think can be done in the near term by this government? Yes, of course. He uh, understands that he needs to uh, do something, uh, reform uh, with intelligence. But first of all, this is about develop democratic and civilian control uh, over the intelligence and to build this uh, balances between uh, his presidential branch, right? Uh, then the cabinet of ministry, parliament, uh, to make procedure to support, like, uh, develop the effective intelligence from one side and another side to make the intelligence will real serve to people, not for some uh, different people, even it's, uh, like, for himself. Actually, we already prepared the law uh, about uh, intelligence and uh, we were restricted, divide, uh, divided their function between themselves. In this law, they tried to, to divide it, this uh, definition about uh, intelligence and uh, police function, investigation function. But it doesn't mean that, uh, for example, security service tomorrow or like in this year will uh, cut their police function. In some directions, like some kind of function will save uh, anyway. We hope to do with some kind of intelligence like partially demilitarization, and it will take a time uh, because it's it, in the same time we need to work on the social protection of uh, people who serve in that case. What else? Ah, oh, for example, if we're talking about security service and uh, on our economy, control intelligence or anti-corruption uh, part, it's actually connect with the bigger system. For example, a government bureau of uh, investigation and how they will develop their function and uh, how they will be effective on a close time. Or uh, in other things, it's like we, we need to create a law about uh, critical infrastructure and make this is list of a bigger biggest operator of base of base basic uh, services and to make uh, clear protection that will give us a chance to divide it, the function inside uh, the security forces and another interesting challenge this is work on cyber and uh, we have a plan to create a it's like discussion inside uh, our party. This is create something like, uh, yeah, something like National Security Agency in one place put all of uh, cyber intelligence function. I know, obviously this is critical work on the intelligence and security services to create this new independent Ukraine that you've, you've mentioned. Uh, can you tell us whose help you're taking on this? Are you taking a lot of Western help in reforming these services or are you trying to do it all on your own? Since 2014, actually, all our intelligence started real work uh, against Russia. And their model not work here because we have a different mentality and uh, different goals. We, of course, uh, try to get experience from international community, but at the same time try to make this closer to our reality. Because, uh, for example, work like in US, you have uh, 17 kind of intelligence. We have no money for paying <laughs> for 17 kind of intelligence. And more ideas, what we have, uh, how to like make our intelligence more effective. This is, for example, create some separate Bureau of Economy investigation. Take this function from uh, police, from uh, security service input in one place and to organize like real balances, democratic and control over this processing. It's important for us and for our cooperation with the Western uh, world. We've, watching the, the Ukraine 
crisis development after Maidan, it seemed to be this conflict between a European identity and, and a, a non-European identity. Uh, do you think that you will be have hopes of uh, of getting close to the European Union again? Uh, how, do, how does your party see that? And uh, how, when you watch what's happening in the European Union, especially with things like Brexit, with Britain coming apparently out of the European Union, does that change your view of what you want from the European Union? Where do you see Ukraine in all that? If the European Union's a mess, does Ukraine still want to join? This is not question inside the country, like more pro-European uh, view or pro some, I don't know what kind of view. This is uh, about pro-Ukraine develop. And uh, of course, we try to find a new markets and new kind of cooperation. And for us, like it's very important to work with our another uh, neighbors. And of course, uh, with the Euro Union. Do you see the European Union as uh, a partner? I think there was five years ago, the discussion was whether Ukraine wanted to join. I mean, there's a different discussion about whether that's an option for Ukraine or not, and it may not be. But I think Hugh's question is, is the European Union as appealing as it once was, given the problems that it has experienced over the last five years? For example, our party thinks that we need to, what we work on, right, to make our stronger relationship with another neighbors, well, like with the Poland, Hungary, even Belarus, in this direction. With the Euro Union, it's uh, easy and hard at the same time. If we're talking about this, like, first of all, we need to figure out what kind of relation Ukraine has with the uh, two base country like uh, Germany and French. And sometimes, uh, from my point of view personally, this country, they think that Russia, this is their resource base and uh, they uh, have strong relation and this is somehow sometimes influence and a policy uh, from this country to Ukraine. From another times when we remind about the values and uh, actually like this is security architecture in, in the Europe continent, of course uh, they start to react somehow and make sanction against Russian. So, Anna, what I'm hearing on this is that you have to have relationships with your neighbors. It's less about the EU as a model than the EU as both an organization and a collection of states with which you also have independent relations that you can't get away from. You just have to engage them on a variety of issues. We want to be understandable and show them that we are a safe country to investment, for example. And here is working EUM, European Mission. They help on reform with the civil security. And uh, of course, with the NATO too, to be understandable and like infrastructure, defense infrastructure in Ukraine for NATO countries. Uh, this is, uh, of course, priority to work with the EU in the general, but it's a complex question and have many kind of like uh, details. It is. It, I mean, I think it's a lot of difficult questions on your agenda. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. I wish you all of the luck in the world in fixing and saving Ukraine. Um, thanks so much for joining us on War and Peace. Thank you for inviting. Thanks for tuning in to War and Peace. Please do check out the rest of our work um, and our other podcasts. Visit our website at www.crisisgroup.org. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.